It's time for a Drummer Nation. Ralph Peterson began playing drums at the age of three. In 1983, he joined the noted Jazz Messengers, one of the few drummers to work with its legendary drummer leader, Art Blakey. He's worked with Betty Carter, the Marsalis Brothers, Terrence Blanchard, Donald Harrison, Roy Hargrove, and John Faddis. He also recorded with and served as leader for the Blue Note stable band Out of the Blue and has many offerings under his own name and label. He presently teaches at Berkeley College of Music and keeps an active touring and performance schedule. My extensive interview with Ralph Peterson, next on Drummer Nation. My guest is the great jazz drummer Ralph Peterson, who happens to be a dear friend. Thank you for doing my show, Ralph. Always a pleasure, Voss. How are you, man? I'm feeling good, man. You know, life has been challenging health-wise, and, and uh, I'm rolling with the punches, and I'm still here. Bionic. Hard to keep a good man down. That's right. Well, you've been it's the subject of enough interviews to where I don't really want to start with uh, what you did as a, a child and how you learned to play the drums. Mm -hmm. But let's start a, where you burst onto the scene in the early 80s yes. as part of the sort of rebirth of the Blue Note label. It was a Blue Note stable band concept that they were trying to build. You know, there was this history with Blue Note Records of all the great stable rhythm sections and stable quartets that every time there was a new artist, they would put, you know, Arthur Taylor and a bass player and, you know, whoever on piano would say John Coltrane, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they weren't household names then those guys in the rhythm section, you know. They were up and coming guys. And so Blue Note decided to put together as a part of this kind of 80s jazz renaissance that uh, is probably most recognized by the work of Wynton and Bradford Marcellus, but also Terrence Blanchard, myself, Terry Lynn, Cindy Blackman, Wallace, who was a little actually before. Wallace was maybe the first guy um, but anyway, Wallace Roney. For Wallace the Roney, yeah, Christian Wallace Rose. Roney. But uh, they put together a band. Joanne Jimenez uh, put together a band in conjunction with Blue Note Records, and Bruce Lundvall, and uh, Louis Nash was the original drummer. And they brought a tenor player down, a Canadian tenor player who had been studying with David Baker, Ralph Bowen. Right, a trumpet player who had been studying with Bill Fielder, Mike Mossman, and a uh, piano player from Rutgers, six foot seven, Harry Pickens, mm -hmm. and uh, Bob Hurst. How did the they bassist. find you? They found me because there was an audition. At the tenth hour, for whatever reasons of his own, Lewis stepped out of the project. And so there was a cattle call. And I had just finished school had recorded with Blanchard and Harrison and had done uh, the gig with Walter Davis in New York, which was my first professional gig in New York, and started my apprenticeship with Art Blakey. So on the heels, on the on the heels, on the coattails of that work, I became eligible for a spot in the audition and, you know, through the study with Michael Carvin, um, taught me very clearly that in New York or any place else in the professional world, nobody gives you gigs, you take them. And so he taught me how, you know, find out, find out the material, you know, learn it so you don't have to read it. Do your homework. If you were there, if you're not set up a half an hour before the thing starts, you're late. If you're not set up a half an hour before this is thing, you know, okay? And so I practiced all of those things and um, had a good day at the instrument and was offered uh, offered the chair, and we made OTB out of the blue and made um, all total three recordings before I, no, uh, out, of, out of the blue, inside track, yeah, three that I was on. Live at Mount Fuji was my last record. Now, it seems to me like that was jazz sort of picking itself up where it left off in the late 60s. Well, you know, Fusion the business had. inside skinny on that is that it was a distribution rescue. 
uh, Toshiba EMI under Hitoshi Namikata uh, forged a deal with Bruce Ludwell to save a then ailing Blue Note Records because Capital was getting ready, Capital Records, the parent, was getting ready to cut Blue Note loose. Mm -hmm. And so a deal was arranged where Blue Note artist records were distributed uh, in Japan for an agreed sum. I see what you mean. And Japanese artists recorded on the new Japanese something else record label, which was a black and white ver. It looked identical to the Blue Note label. Right. But Except it was in black and white. Right. Aside from distribution and business stuff, musically, where was it coming from? Musically, it was coming from a place, I believe, where clubs were closing down. So the apprenticeship system was under attack. The system that I came up with, playing with Walter Davis and with I Blakey, and all the people that came through the Jazz Messengers, and, and even the system in New Orleans with Alvin Batiste and Ellis Marcellus that created the Marcellus Brothers and Terrence Blanchard and uh, Marlon Jordan and all the great musicians in my generation and after that that, that uh, have come down the pike. As clubs closed down, those bands worked less. And as those bands worked less, the leaders needed security for their family. So they started taking teaching gigs. And uh, universities started hiring working jazz professors, even before I got in school, but the Livingston College jazz program under Paul Jeffrey is a classic example of that. You had Paul Jeffrey, Michael Carvin teaching drums, Paul Jeffrey teaching saxophone and arranging who's responsible for, we were talking about our good friend Jerry Weldon. Uh, at one point in history, I think it was around 1988 or 89, the entire saxophone section for Lionel Hampton's band was the same saxophone section that I played with in college. All of Paul's students. Um, Larry Ridley on bass, Kenny Barron was teaching piano. Um, and so these guys were still working and so the apprenticeship system began to move out of the clubs because the clubs were cold closing and into the institutions. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to be offered. A, I started my college teaching gig way before maybe I was worthy of earning it. But I had the great honor of being hired at Essex Community College in Newark, New Jersey by the bassist Aaron Bell, who was the bassist on uh, Duke and Train's Take the Cold Train. That's you right. Know? And so uh, <laughs> Denzel Washington say, luck is when opportunity and preparation intersect. So having put in the work, the opportunity presented itself, and I, I just kept trying to refire on that same formula, mm -hmm. which is brought me from Essex County College through University of the Arts in, the, in Philadelphia, uh, through Juilliard, uh, the New School, Rutgers, Princeton, and now I'm in my 14th year at Berklee College of Music. Yeah. That's great. Now, I know you, you, you make no bones of talking about it, but there was a period there where you almost self-destructed as well, right? Absolutely. I was my own worst enemy. And... Uh, I guess uh, from the last time I checked, it's been about, we'd say 30 minutes. So, you know, uh, I know exactly how long it's been since I took my, since I've engaged in my last destructive activity. And, you know. Uh, and that's I'm, been many years now. It's been over 20 years now. Well, good for you, man. You know, and so. Uh, There's a message from Art. Yeah. That's my phone ringer on uh, Monin. That's all right, but it was the right song. Yeah, right. Um, 
So you, you, by the grace of God, you got through that. That's right. And you've been I, sober for a long time. I've been clean and sober for a long time, and it's a part of what I share, not just with my students, but with the world. Mm -hmm. It's a part of my story. It's embedded in my music. Um, well, let's talk about Berkeley for a sec. Okay. You're a jazz artist. Mm -hmm. No bones about that. Nope. Um, Berkeley is a school that embraced jazz music, but, but it's also... To me, the drum set, if we do a serious study of the drum set, it's a jazz instrument. It came up as a jazz instrument. My good friend Enrique Almeida, the great drummer who's at Berkeley, uh, tells everybody in, <laughs> at, at faculty meetings all the time, we got to stop this kind of pop culture push to try to push jazz out of Berkeley because we'll all be out of a job because the drum set itself was created for jazz music. So you take away that. No matter what my student decides to do with their music, and we were talking about a couple of them. We have a couple of, of students who, where our stories have intersected, whether it's Justin Faulkner playing with Branford Marcellus or Mark Whitfield playing with everybody else, or Cush Abaday, or, or Lyndon Rochelle with Esperanza, or Matt Gartska with Animals as Leaders. It's the things I try to teach are about playing the instrument correctly and about the learning of music, right? I mean, what I, what I focus on goes a lot past playing the instrument. Developing, developing a vocabulary. Well, I of think a music. good teacher at that level is a mentor, is a life mentor. Sure. It's more than just how do you hold the sticks. Sure. <laughs> Obviously. Sure. So and I'm, sometimes it takes students a semester or two to figure out that that's why they're really there. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and, and and I'll draw this analogy, and this would happen. This is the kind of conversation that would happen in a lesson. I would tell a student, look, 20 years ago when I got clean. I thought I was getting clean for X, Y, and Z reasons. Improve my relationship with my daughter. I wanted my mother and father to be proud. And you know, 10, 12, 15 years into that, I started to get in touch with the real reason it was important for me to get and stay clean. And a lot of it has to do with me not being useless to the planet unless uh, I stay true to my story. And the, the truth about my story is my cutoff switch is broken. It's a really simple thing. You don't have to get all psychological or brain chemistry or addictive personality. But I got the, a switch in my system that's broken. But in the sense of what we're talking about, these are the things you lay on perspective young players that that's right. make a big difference in their lives. Sure, because they're, they're beginning a journey that I'm sharing my experience mm -hmm on either having been more than halfway through or have gotten out of the other side on. Now, if I'm a drum, a young drum student at Berkeley, I have a choice of my teachers or, cause you I mean, there's, a, there's great rock guys there and pop guys and Latin guys and Brazilian guys and There is guys. no question at Berkeley College of Music, and, and I say this, and reasonable people can disagree, but Berkeley College of Music has the most impressive percussion faculty on the planet. There's like at least 47. No, there's more than 47 because Berkeley College of Music just merged with Boston Conservatory, the oldest music school in the country. So now the Boco percussion instructors who are specialized in orchestral and classical mm -hmm. are now also a part of the Berkeley factory. So there's over 50 of us now. And uh, it's a department of specialists, like you said. You got your brain surgeons, you got mm -hmm. your dermatologists, mm -hmm. you got your feet people, you got your. So, does the student make these a la carte decisions, or is that. When a student comes in as a freshman, their first semester, they have very little choice. Mm -hmm. As they matriculate through their semesters, they move up in the line. I see. Simply the line of registration is offered to upperclassmen get to register first, mm -hmm. then, you know, the juniors, then the sophomores, and then the freshmen, they uh, they register last. But uh, by the end of their second year, 
they're put in a position where they're able to make what we call a style track decision okay. about what they want to start that's what to I was study as a specialty. And mm -hmm. that style track decision was actually implemented <laughs> into the curriculum on the birth of a class that I introduced to the curriculum called Jazz Drum Set Repertoire Development and Application. You know, the administrators like big titles. Mm -hmm. Really simply put simply, 50 tunes, 15 weeks. And not just being able to play time and hit all the kicks and the hits, but to be able to play the melody of confirmation. With the proper phrasing mm -hmm. and nuance and shading and space, which, if you're looking to build melodic solos, is a necessary component. And one. one of the questions I ask on the first day is, how do you build a melodic solo if you don't know no melodies? <laughs> you know, you, you hear these drum solos that move from one really well thought out, thoroughly practiced drum thing to the next really well thought out, thoroughly plastic uh, practiced drum thing to the third, and then they're just like, it's, it's not just, musical. It's not musical. Does that come from singing? When I was coming up, we were always taught to sing. You sing the sing melodies that fit the form of the song, and express them that way. Is that that was a that was and remains a common approach with many, but not one that I subscribe to. And here's why: Take a melody like Moose the Mooch. Boop, beep, boop, now that's a lot of information mm -hmm. to have running in the back of your mainframe. Well, I didn't mean... Uh, Let me finish. All right, I'm sorry. When you're trying to create a solo over rhythm changes, mm -hmm. and you're saying, and, and the idea is sing the melody so that you can know where you are. Let me interrupt you. I didn't mean singing the melody of the song, but singing a melody. But do bop da do do bop bees up do bop do bop do bop. Yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. But you're still singing a melody. Sure. And but you're you improvising. You're yes. The idea of singing it before you play it. These students are required to attempt to sing it. I say, okay, take all the pitches out. Oh, I'll take my horn to the class because I play trumpet. I'll take my horn to the class and I'll play confirmation with the whole horn at half vowels. So there's really no discernible pitches. They're all And so the contour and shape of the melody become the thing that makes them able to answer the question, what tune was that? Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, it was kind of a funky version of confirmation. And so what does that prove in the context of playing an instrument of indefinite pitch? Mm -hmm. I see. It's that correlation. That the phrasing is more important than the pitches. Now, I've had the great honor of working with uh, one of uh, jazz's most in-demand drummers who took that very lesson and ran to, to the melodic extreme end of it and who has made his reputation on his ability to play on a three drum kit four pitches at least out of each drum and therefore having 12 tones therefore being able to play any melody mm -hmm. including confirmation and of course I'm talking about Ari Honig you know and so <clears throat> Students are supposed to run with what their teachers give them. And either it's okay if they hit a brick wall, mm -hmm. and it's okay if they bust through mm -hmm. and create a new beginning. Because it's all been done before one way or the other. Well, we were talking about the program at Berkeley and what a great program it is, and certainly there are some wonderful students coming out of that school right. popping up everywhere. Right. But I have to ask you this question. Okay. This is the 800-pound gorilla in the room of education that nobody likes to talk about. Okay. Where are all these guys going to work? The answer is not every 
Ber every instrumentalist at Berkeley is not just studying to play a gig. And through my work with, as an, as an educator, through my work as a clinician, through my work even with my martial arts programs and schools, uh, through my employing of students in technical aspects like uh, chart reading, because these kids are way faster at finale and Sibelius than I am, uh, hiring them for sound, video and audio editing and stuff like that. I'm trying to show them that there's a lot more to being a musician now than in getting a gig at Dizzy's. That's a piece of it, and it's an important piece of it, or whatever other club in New York or mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. festival you want to play. But uh, having a diverse portfolio as an artist is crucial. One of the most explosive areas of the music business is the merging, and we can both understand this because our wives are nurses, but the merging of music and healthcare, otherwise known as music therapy. Remo Bellix all, was all about that. Music rest, therapy rest is, is made huge. Rest in peace. Absolutely. Music therapy is huge and, and an exploding program at, at Berkeley. And so, uh, when you're young and you got no kids and you can live on a box of fried rice for a week. Ramen noodles. Ramen noodles, right? <laughs> Barbecue potato chips on Thanksgiving. You know, that's good eating. Um, you can play 30 and 40 and $50 gigs as long as you're living in a room, in an apartment, you know, with nine other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the apartments aren't getting any cheaper. But that's a point well taken. A and they're getting port smaller. A rounded portfolio. So, so my answer to the question is mm -hmm. a diverse portfolio. Yeah. And, and through what I do, I try to show them. Because they're all wowie wowed by the 2% of, let's say, jazz artists. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's... You, Witten has often said, and this is one of the things I, I really agree with him, is that jazz is one of the clearest expressions of American democracy or the American political system because 2%, just like in our American economy, 2% of the population control 98% of the wealth. And having been a two percenter in my early career, um, I'm not a young lion anymore. I feel like I'm an old wily panther or something, right? And uh, your, your concerns have to evolve. You, your music has to evolve. Your audience has to evolve. You have to start, when you're younger, you want the attention of the older audience. As you get older, that flips, and you have to start to get the attention of the younger artists and younger audiences and play music that speaks to them and have titles and deal that deal with uh, things that they can identify with. And so uh, that's why Art Blakey always kept young people in the jazz messages. Well, I have a... a Dear friend who passed away last year, Bob Masteller, owned a jazz club in Hilton Head. Mm -hmm. And he said when he was a young man, his dad said, if you want to get better, you have to find older players to work with. Yeah. But what he didn't tell him was when you get older. you got to have, you got <laughs> to find younger them. players to work with because sharks only swim in one direction, forward. Right? And so to stay on the cutting edge, you have to know what the younger play. You have to, you don't have to emulate them, mm -hmm. but you need to know. It's a different energy what's being said, how the energy is being used, and then you can, in your wisdom and experience, actually enhance, you know, and if you can communicate to them, open up lines of communication. I have great communication with a lot of the young drummers in jazz. 
A lot of them call me Uncle Ralph, which make me feel old. But I keep my gray hairs and my goatee all it's, it's an, trimmed it's down. It's respect and honor. Yeah. Right. Well, you know, and I appreciate that. I'm honored that they would think to refer to me mm-hmm. with that level of respect. Mm-hmm. And so I call them my soldiers. You know, I'm building an army, of, a truth army. And it may not be based on popularity. It may not, but my guys are working. Well, let's talk, when you and I first met, mm-hmm. you said something to me really, it was key. You said, it's gotta be about the truth. Yeah. Let's deal with the truth. Yeah. What you mean by, I know what you meant, but let's talk about what you meant. Jazz is African-American classical music. It comes out of the African-American diaspora. That's an immutable truth. That means in order to deal with the highest expressions of it throughout its history, you have to go to artists who look like me. Uh, Now, in America, social socially and politically speaking that can be uncomfortable for some people but the uncomfortability is what puts the that's what makes the music real if the music doesn't make you feel anything for example the truth about america is that african americans are the only ethnic group besides the Native American that didn't immigrate to this country. We were brought. The Native Americans were here, and we were brought in chains. Mm -hmm. And to suggest that the whole legacy that flowed out of that ended when Barack Obama was elected president can only seem reasonable if you don't know what that legacy is. And so that's ignorance. That's the absence of truth. And so, uh, well, let me, let me, without putting words in your mouth, mm-hmm. let me ask you this. Is it fair to say that once a music is created, it belongs to the world at large? Absolutely. And that you, it wasn't, doesn't have to be of any given color to play no. a certain kind of music. No. But that in But you have music, to be you know, honest about what you're playing when you play it, whether it's rock and roll, mm-hmm. <laughs> jazz, gospel, contemporary gospel. Mm-hmm. You know, gospel chops is where funk lives now Mm -hmm. where the real funk lives is in all of the gospel chop drums Mm -hmm. but what i was getting at is is it fair to say that for jazz music to be true and authentic there is an african-american essence to the music yes and and to deny it is to deny part of yourself and uh you can never be complete if you don't accept that truth Quick divergent story. Great movie uh, with Gene Hackman, Lawrence Fishburne, Fishburne, and uh, I can't think of the woman that's an actress who plays Gene Hackman's daughter, and they're lawyers. What's the movie? I'm trying to think of the name. Anyway, there's a scene. The girl is real hard on her father because the parents split up. And the parents split up because of the kind of dogged commitment that the lawyer has to the law. Mm-hmm. But the daughter's just like the father. And so Lawrence Fishburne is the friend, the the uh, the office, uh, the paralegal in the office who works with the daughter and is explaining to the daughter, you got to cut him a break because un- you're turning yourself inside out trying to figure out who you are and until you forgive him, it's going to make you being you impossible. Mm. <laughs> right? And I was like, Poof! it's one of the moments where if you don't understand where this music comes from and at least have a healthy respect and knowledge, and I'm not saying it's exclusively African-American. No, I hear you. 
But the non-African Americans who have moved this music forward have done so because of their willingness to accept this truth. You know, and it you can argue about it till the cows come home, but in the end, it's still the same. I don't find anything to argue with there. That, that, sure. That's why I asked you about it. Um, moving on, how about some of the ensembles and uh, work you're doing now? Well, I'm really, at Berkeley, I'm really excited about uh, having a permanent big band ensemble. We do primarily Art Blakey Jazz Messenger big band arrangements, and I became a jazz messenger through playing in the Art Blakey two drummer big band. So it gives me an opportunity to pass on what I learned there and what I learned from Paul Jeffries at the Rutgers Big Band experience as a student on to my current students. And that's all I have. It, it, my experience is more valuable than my opinions. My experiences are created from my opinions. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry, that's backwards. My opinions are a product of my experience. But I try to share <laughs> my experience because opinions, and I'll give you the clean version, are like earlobes. <laughs> <laughs> That's clean. Everybody's got at least two, mm -hmm. and some of them have holes in them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got a little hole too. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, that brings me to um, an opinion. And then, Go ahead, finish that. And, that then, I, and then I have uh, an original ensemble which has, over the years, spawned the latest version of the Fotet. Um, Give me the opportunity to literally employ students who take to heart what I'm trying to teach and practice it on a high level. And that's the apprenticeship system mm -hmm. that uh, is fading to a certain extent in the street. Because everybody wants the young. And there's nothing wrong with being young. The only thing that's wrong with being young is that nobody stays young. <laughs> and the, the, the one group of people who don't figure that out, who can't wrap their head around that, are young people. <laughs> <laughs> but when they wake up... Youth is wasted on the young, is what, they is what I'm saying. Yeah. And when they wake up and realize, hey, I ain't young no more. <laughs> And nobody cares. That day happens. And it happens. It's, it's <laughs> coming for you. All right? um, they start to try to have a more serious approach mm -hmm. to their life and what it means and what's important and priorities and so forth. And then I have a group uh, in an ensemble where I get to indulge uh, myself as a trumpet player um, and we work on some of the music that will eventually be recorded on my first trumpet record coming soon. It's the reason I started my own label. Well, let me point out to our viewers, listeners, Ralph is a, an estimable trumpet player. He, it's not something he takes lightly and no. plays very well. Yeah, and I've had to battle back, you know, we started out with the health considerations. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 2014 kind of started a domino effect of life on life's terms. When my father passed. And, Sorry for that. Yeah, well, you know, nobody leaves this life alive. Mm -hmm. But he went suddenly, and I was grateful for the relationship we had built over over my whole life, but especially during, after I kind of cleaned up my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I got him to be, to see him proud. I got to see him proud of me. I'm sure he was. And that was that was very important. And I was incredibly proud of him. He's he he said, oh, I don't want to get off into. Let a, me go another way into I'll, into a father thing because it could take a while. But not long after that, I was hit with Bell's palsy. And that curtailed your trumpet playing. It took my trumpet playing away. Now, how did it go away? I'm back playing again. And I, and I had to make some equipment adjustments. I couldn't play in the big, giant mouthpiece that I had built mm -hmm. an embouchure over 30 years 
preparing, trying to but plan. But Bell's palsy is a weird thing, right? It comes and goes. I mean, it, it can come and go. It, it went away. It went away, thank goodness. Um, it's a viral infection of a facial nerve, which I got, I believe, from one of my grandchildren who had a sinus infection. And we were sharing a water bottle. And uh, to Life start, happens. Yeah. Well, and so then, so then after that came the decaying right hip. And right before I was going to get my hip replaced, I was diagnosed with cancer, lower GI cancer. And uh, November 5th, 2015, um, December 1st, I went in for the cancer surgery. Surgery was successful. The first day of the spring semester at Berkeley, I started chemo and radiation. And... I started getting up in the morning. You know, after I went through my period of grief and had my little pity party <laughs> and the balloons all lost the air. Why me, why me? Yeah, I, then I got pissed off. Mm -hmm. and, and once I got pissed off, I started to attack. I followed your progress on Facebook and I, thank God you've come through this. Yeah. But if I could find a personality trait in any person I knew that could make this, it would be you. Because you were just like, I'm going to kick this thing's ass. Well, and I'm gonna or post my progress. it's going to have to catch me to take me out of here. Mm -hmm. um, very often people are faced with problems, whether it's a health problem or an emotional problem or a financial problem, and they stare at the problem. And they let the problem immobilize them instead of immediately starting to seek the solutions. That's you. <laughs> well, I've learned that over 20 years of recovery and practice in Buddhism mm -hmm. to look at life a certain way. There's a cause, cause and effect nature to the way the universe works. And I've learned that you can never... You can never find the right answers if you're asking the wrong question, you know? And well that, that's embedded in popular culture like The Matrix. That scene mm -hmm. where Neo meets the woman with the rabbit on her shoulder, and then he meets Trinity, mm -hmm. and, and, he's, and Trinity says, it's the question that drives you. The question was then was, what is The Matrix? But in that moment, after reading books like the seven habits of highly effective people. You create a visualization. You realize that if you keep asking the wrong question, you'll never, you'll never get the right answer. And very often the question is, why me? And that's kind of ain't the point. Right. After, it's, after it is you, why you is kind of one of the least important questions to ask. Mm -hmm. How do I get not here? What do I need to do? Yeah. A couple of more things, Ralph, before yeah. I let you go. Sure. Uh, I think it's certainly worth noting that as a leader, you probably have more albums, CDs, releases out than any drummer I know of. Thanks, man. My next recording, Dream Deferred, on my own label is the seventh on my label and my 20th as a leader, all total. <laughs> my 20th record as a leader. And uh, it's with a group new group called Aggregate Prime features Gary Thomas, Kenny Davis on bass, Gary Thomas on tenor saxophone and flute, uh, Mark Whitfield on guitar, and VJ Iyer on piano. And in dedication to my recent hip replacement, the first tune is called Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> That's my nickname for you. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, doing the label stuff has been an important part of owning my own, the direction of my career. That along with the great stuff that's been happening industry-wise, you know, which is how we met, mm -hmm. you know. Thank goodness for uh, what used to be Symbol uh, Masters and it's- We had Boss for Symbols, and we can say that. Boss we had a symbols, relationship through that. And that's how we positive. met. Voss signed me and we did a line of symbols and then, uh, you know, business happened and and we moved on, and I'm really happy at where I landed, and 
He's happy where he landed. So it's a happily ever after story. We had a hell of a good time. Yeah, and we had a good time. And now, you know, through this venture, we can continue to stay in touch. And I'm really excited Mm -hmm. about that. And you're with Mino now. I'm with Mino, and we've created a uh, 22-inch Cemetery ride and a 21-inch Nuance ride. And, uh, you know, just to push the envelope, I've had, I got the prototypes on the matching hi-hats, but we're not there yet. But okay. <laughs> It's fun developing symbols. I do it, miss that. It is. Working it is. with Bill great Zildjian. artists like you and, and working on prototypes. And, you know, when it's a lot when of we released the, the symmetry, Bill sent me an inbox message. Bill Zildjian being uh, one of the sons of Bob Zildjian, who mm-hmm. was Sabian, mm-hmm. the founder of Sabian. He says, Ralph, you know, if you learn too much more about symbols, we're going to have to come down there and deal with you. You know, and Bill being a martial artist like me, I said, well, you better bring more than a couple of guys. You better be ready. <laughs> you better be ready. Yeah, and also Vic Firth and Evans have been great. This Dream Deferred project is being crowdfunded now, so please go to Indiegogo and look up Aggregate Prime. Um, The current release is a trio record, my third in the triangular series with the Curtis brothers, uh, one of which who was a student of mine at Berkeley, the great bassist, Lucas Mm -hmm. Curtis, Mm -hmm. and his brother, Zakai. That CD is available now on iTunes and CD Baby. And... uh, the kit that I'm playing on that CD was is a custom kit. Uh, bass drum was made by Nodar Road, and the toms were administered by our late great friend Joe Hibbs. And uh, it's a configuration: is 13 inch floor tom, 10 inch rack tom, regular uh, normal standard snare, and a 16 inch bass drum. And now through Mapex, I'm coming up on my 25th year with the company. I don't think anybody, I don't even think anybody, roster or administration, has been there that long. I've seen the whole thing turn over, yeah. maybe twice. Well, we all miss free. Joe Hibbs. Yeah. Uh, rest his soul. And I think he had something to do with you and I meeting in the first place. Absolutely. And they're going to create a 25th anniversary trio kit for me. So I'm excited. The future's got a lot of exciting things going on. And you make it happen, too. That's great. Well, thanks a lot, Ralph. It's great to have you on my show. Always my pleasure. Uh, we're, we're always pals. I don't care what symbols you play. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> and you are all right with me. I don't care what nobody else says. <laughs> I don't know why nobody likes you. I think you're okay. Right? <laughs> anyway, one of my dear friends, Ralph Peterson, thank you for spending some time with us. It's and my... look for his releases. Look for his students because they're bad. And um, if you can hear this gentleman play, you won't regret it. It's an thanks, honor, and, honor and a privilege for us. Thank you. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I want to thank our friends at Atlanta Pro Percussion. Danette Classic Drums, Sabian Cymbals, and Classic Drummer Magazine. We'll see you again in two weeks. <laughs>